Hello. You're watching Building a Web Application using ASP.NET Core 1.0, Node.js, Aurelia, TypeScript, and Webpack in Visual Studio Code, Part 6, Section 3. In this part, I'm going to talk about how to enable cores, cross-origin resource sharing in Express and Happy Applications. Then we'll talk about how to generate UML class diagrams from TypeScript modules which might come in very handy when you want to see the complete um, interface and, and classes and their relationships. Modifying routers to take an optional ID parameter. This is very helpful when we want to make a call from the client application with an ID of the contact in the uh, URL because we're building a contact manager application and uh, we'll be integrating the back and rest um, APIs into our front end and, and one of the requirements is to pass the ID parameter and then be able to return the contact matching the ID. Then we'll talk about how to merge the ASP.NET Core and Node.js backend REST API implementations that has been done so far. Um, I will show how we can put all of these uh, implementations into a single folder structure with a single Aurelia client application source code without duplicating them, which is going to be very helpful if you want to do bug fixes and we want to add more features, it's always better to have them um, in a single place rather than having to duplicate the code because they'll go easily out of sync and synchronizing them is a nightmare. Okay, then let's dive right into the actual implementation now. The first thing we want to do is to enable course in, in our Express application followed by the Happy application. Why do I need to enable course? If you remember, our client application is running on localhost 9000. Whereas our Node.js REST API um, is, is being served from localhost 8080 and our ASP.NET Core REST API is served from localhost 5000. Even though they're all coming from localhost, you cannot make calls across different ports because they're considered cross origins. So in order for a client application that is running on a different port or a different URL to make a call into another a REST API or REST API endpoints running on other URL or other ports, you need to enable the course on the server side. So, which means that we will have to enable the course on both the ASP.NET Core as well as on the Node.js. If you noticed the earlier parts of the series, I've already shown how you can enable course on ASP.NET Core. So, in this section of the of this part, we're gonna sh we're gonna see how we can enable course in Express and happy applications. Uh, the rest if I already has the um, the course enabled. So we'll do some refactoring and we will we will um, we will enable course um, in all these application frameworks one by one. So let's start with the express application first. So I'm gonna go in there and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first install a useful module called course module that comes handy to enable course on Express.js. So I'm going to go to the commander and let me install the um, course using npm install course dash dash save. And this course module doesn't comes with uh, doesn't come with the TypeScript type definition file. So I'm going to have to install it explicitly using the typing tool. So I'll use the typing tool to install the uh, type definition typings install dt for definitely typed course and then we want to save it and then it's a global uh, definition so that command will install the typescript type definitions now that we've installed the uh, actual package and the type definitions we can start using that from our A express application source code i'm going to import the course module using the import star as course from course syntax and then I'm going to enable that for all of my routes. I don't want to be, I don't want to enable course only for a certain URL or certain routes. I want to enable it for all, all the routes. So here's how you enable it using the this.expressapplication.use call. And then you will, the first one will be the, um, uh, the first one will be the uh, course function call. So let us do that now from the completed application, we'll just copy the code. As you can see, I'm calling the course function, which will set all the required headers. The, the important headers that we are looking for are access control allow origin, access control allow headers, and access control allow methods. 
usually you can use a wildcard to indicate that hey accept request from any origin uh, and accept all the http verbs like get post put delete or access um all the uh, allow all the headers like you know accept um you know authorization there are quite a few headers this course function is a shortcut and handles setting up all those headers for us so we don't have to worry about setting them individually okay so that will enable course on the express um, application which comes very handy and um, also let us take this moment to uh, let's take this opportunity to refactor the constructor as well the constructor should only do the construction nothing more than that so I'm going to take those um, extra calls that will configure the API route and the error routes into the bootstrap function so it looks very clean now now that we've enabled course on the Express application, let's move on to the Happy application, and then we'll enable course there as well. Okay, so let's open the Happy application. Um, enabling course in Happy application is very simple because all it, uh, it needs is a second parameter or a, or, or, or a second um, property inside of this um, JSON object um, that is called routes, and then it needs the um, the course property set to true. So I'm going to take that code from the completed application and I'm going to paste it here. As you can see, we're adding an additional property called routes and then we're setting the course property inside of that to true. This will enable course in Happy. It's that simple. Let's move on to the rest of the application now. He, we already have enabled course here, but we're going to again refactor that code into the bootstrap method like we did on other frameworks. So I'm going to take this call from here all the way um, we're going to leave this create server call so we're going to take this and we're also going to take all of this from the constructor and move them into the bootstrap method and let's remove this warnings by removing the empty white space okay and we really don't need to push the authorization header because I will revisit this when I talk about authentication and authorization. So for now, it's enough, in, enough if you call the course helper function. And here we, we, we waste a local variable, so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to just copy this guy. And I'm going to use this dot restify application instead of the local variable server. And I'm going to delete this needless assignment. Okay, we're all set. Now we've enabled course so we can make the call into the node.js rest api uh, implementation using these three frameworks express happy and restify from our aurelia js front-end application okay now that we've enabled course it's time for us to talk about that uml class diagram generation tool uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to install the tool from the command line from within node.js folder and the name of the tool is called tsvis TypeScript visualizer. So I'm going to run that command. It's going to be installed globally. Um, so I'm going to just run npm install tsvis-g. And uh, um, tsvis has a few command line parameters. So if you just type tsvis, it should give you the uh, switches. There are two switches. One is called dependencies using dash d. Another one is dash r. So I'm going to take tsvis command and you need to specify the folder from where so the source file name of the source directory so it's going to be in server folder under source contact manager that's where we have all of our um, classes defined classes and interfaces defined and i'm going to use dash d for dependencies and dash r for recursive and the output file name that i want it has to be a png file i'm going to give the file name as contact dash manager dash class dash diagram you can give any name you want. I thought this is more meaningful. Diagram.png. And that should generate the, the contact manager class diagram. We can just go and take a look at that folder. Inside Node.js, we should see that class diagram. We can just double click and open it and see that. We may have to zoom it a little bit. So I'm going to use the plus symbol. Yeah, as you can see, it gives a beautiful class diagram and it shows what class depends on what other classes and so on so it comes in handy if you're really interested in um, knowing the complete class relationship and the interface and, and all those connections inside of our application I'm going to close that now that we've done with the class diagram I'm going to move on to accommodate that optional ID parameter 
in our um, in our routes. So let's first focus on how to accommodate the ID parameter in the Express application. Okay, I'm going to go to the Express contact router, and um, in um, Express JS, there's a nice uh, way of specifying an optional parameter using the colon and the name of the parameter and a question mark to indicate that it is optional. So what does it mean is it is it need not have to be mandatorily present in the URL segment, but if it is present, it will pick up that value. Whatever that comes after slash contact slash will be assigned to the variable ID. Now, because it's an optional um, parameter, we need to check if the parameter exists. And if it exists, we're going to look at uh, the, in, the look at the in-memory um, contact service and then ask for it to return the contact that matches this ID. So uh, we're going to just check. I'm going to add an if else call. So I will just bring the completed code and I'll explain that. So it'll be easier. So here it is. So I'm going to just take that and we're going to replace this with the if else statement. Okay, so if the ID is available, then we'll call the get method instead of the get all method, and then we're going to parse that into an integer because the parameter comes as a string. So use this 10 to to indicate that the radix is 10, which means it's a decimal. And then we'll once the once the um, contact service dot get returns, we'll return that single contact, which is supposed to be returned based on the matching ID. Otherwise, we'll return all the contacts, which is kind of, in our case, it's going to be four hard-coded contacts. Okay, so that's it. We've enabled the optional ID parameter on Express. Let's see how we can do it on the um, happy contact router. So in the happy contact router, uh, again, you can use this ID um, curly brace ID question mark syntax. That'll uh, give you the optional parameter. Um, so, but we are not handling it. So I'm going to handle that again using the same if if else block. So here's how it's going to be done. So I'm going to take that and replace this with if else. Okay. So what does it do? It checks if the if the ID is available in the URL segment. It it picks up that and then it does the same thing. It calls the get method and and converts it into integer into integer before it passes. And as you can see, you see a red squiggly. This is because TypeScript thinks that uh, there is no such um, parameter. There is no such property called ID. It is perfectly valid because it's a runtime property. It's a dynamic property. Um, remember, we we also used to get another error on the output uh, parameter on the request. That's also a, a dynamic dynamic property. So you can just ignore this warning. Um, as long as you pass the ID, this is going to be a non-null value. And if it's non-null, it's going to enter into this if block and it's going to be parsed and, and it's going to be sent to the get method, which will look up in the in-memory repository uh, for a contact with the matching ID. Okay, so that is how you enable it on the happy framework. The Restify is slightly different. Restify does not support the concept of an optional parameter. So what we need to define is we need to define another endpoint which takes the ID as an argument. So we are going to define that right after that. Um, this main endpoint where it says API slash contacts here, we're going to define that in a, in a special block. So we're going to have its own endpoint with a slash colon ID, and then we'll use that to define that endpoint with a single get method. So here we go. So we declared another endpoint method. And then um, let me see if we close it properly. I think it is not closed. So let's put the curly brace here. This one is closed. This one is also closed. But I think we need another closing curly brace, which is this. Okay, there we go. We closed it, and I'm going to indent this if clause so you can see that clearly. Okay, so it's the same thing except that this time, since it doesn't have an optional parameter, the Restify framework we have to define it explicitly. I'm using the um, ECMAScript 2015 string interpolation syntax. I'm leveraging the previous endpoint that is being defined, and it is, I'm going to tag a slash colon ID to the end of it. If that is present, we'll call the get method, and then We'll, we'll return that. Okay, so we've added the support for the optional ID parameter on all three frameworks. Now let us see how we can merge 
the source code, um, the ASP.NET Core REST API source code and the Node.js source code into a single project. Okay. Let's open up the, uh, the project folder and then we'll start creating the required folders and start merging the source code from part five to part six. The first thing I want to do is to create a folder called client. That's where I'm going to keep my client Aurelia web application source code. And the first thing is we want to move all of this server side code from part five into part six. So I'm going to copy that here. And then I'm going to move the client side source from the source folder just into the client folder. Right click, drag and drop, and then say copy here. Okay, so now we've got all of those brought in, but we have a few more steps. So we have to be patient and then follow the steps one by one so we can successfully merge them and we'll be able to launch two instances of Visual Studio, one to debug the ASP.NET Core, another one to debug the um, Node.js REST API. Uh, but both will share the common client application, which is built using um, Aurelia. So that is the goal. Okay, what are the next steps? The next steps are going to be um, making a symbolic link. So we have a client folder and we need a copy of the client folder, but not exactly a clone, rather a pointer to that client application. We can do that using the mklink command. Um, and then we're going to run that command from within our uh, commander command line tool. So I'm going to copy the, the command from my blog post and I'm going to paste it onto the commander command line. Okay, let me open up the commander. And you have to do it from the Node.js folder. So I'm inside the Node.js folder and I'm going to run this command. So what does this command mean? Launch the command prompt and invoke the mklink command and slash j is a switch to create the symbolic link. And the name of the link is called client. It should point to dot dot slash client. That means go up one level and then point to the client folder one level above. So if you hit enter, you'll see that it'll create a cool shortcut. So this might look like a folder, but it's actually pointing to the, the client one level above. So this is how we are going to share uh, the, the source code between the two backend system, which is the ASP.NET Core and Node.js. As you can see, the slash J switch means a junction. It's creating a symbolic link, also known as junction. Okay, so then because we now created a junction, we need to take care of our tsconfig.json because tsconfig.json is going to blindly go ahead and, and, and compile uh, or transpile every TypeScript file. So we want to prevent that from doing that into this uh, linked folder. Um, so the first thing we want to do is to open up the um, the tsconfig.json of the um, of the Node.js project and, and prevent it from transpiling this linked or the junction client folder. Okay, so let's open up the Node.js project. We'll go into tsconfig.json and we'll add that client folder, which means that that client folder, which is a linked folder, will not be transpiled. That's the first step. Then the next one that we want to do is to um, to, to mention how do, how do we let our client application, um, how do we let our uh, webpack um, config.js to know that it has to run this source code from client source instead of, the, uh, instead of just the source folder. So what we need to do is we need to load that project, I mean, from, the, from one level above, which is the modern folder. I'm gonna launch Visual Studio Code from there. And then I am going to maximize that and zoom it up a little bit. And once it's loaded, we're going to just touch the webpack config.js file and uh, change the source dir variable to client source slash source. Instead of source, we're going to just change it to client slash source. We'll ignore this warning for now because we're going to install TypeScript locally to 
to support the latest version so then what we're going to do is we're going to install the uh, required packages because we just copied it from part 5 so we need to install all of the packages mentioned in the um, mentioned in our package.json before I run this command I just wanted to upgrade the version of my webpack server to beta 22 so I'm going to open up the package.json and go all the way down to the place from where we got the webpack version we can mention the version number as 22 okay now that we've boosted the version number we can run the npm install command followed by the typings install command because our client application has a lot of typings as well and then what we want to do is to install the typescript locally uh, we don't have to wait for this to complete i'm going to open up another command prompt and then i'm going to go back one level up and i'm going to install typescript using the npm install command so it is going to be npm install typescript at 2.0 and I'm going to install it locally by using the dash dash save dash dev to indicate that it is a development time dependency, not a runtime dependency. And um, while these are being installed, what we're going to do is we're going to turn our attention into the tsconfig.json of our Node.js project, um, sorry, of our client project. Uh, from the client project, we need to tell that the TypeScript compiler should ignore the node.js folder because that's where all of our server-side uh, classes typescript classes are living so how just as how we prevented our client-side application to to look at the server to transpile the server-side um, javascript file um, sorry just as how we did um, prevent our server-side um, tsconfig.json to 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 not look at the client-side typescript we had to do the opposite from our tsconfig.json on the client side so we just need to ignore the node.js folder if you don't give exclude um, if you don't give the folder in exclude um, settings uh, tsconfig.json has the tendency to go all the way up or all the way down and start transpiling every typescript file so that's just just a protection to avoid unnecessary transpiling okay so with that um, i think let's go back and check if the typescript is done okay that is done but I think the other one is going to take a while to install. So I'm going to pause the video because it's not fun sitting there and watching the NPM doing the install. Okay, so it's um, completed uh, the installation of all the packages. Now we're going to do the typings install command to get the typings type definitions. So after this is done, I will show you how you can change your configuration file, which is under the client source, um, we're going to open up the um, the project client source and then um, there we can make the changes in the config.ts file to support um, to support uh, both Node.js as well as the um, ASP.NET Core. As you can see right now it's pointing to port 5000 which means that it is going to hit the um, it's going to hit the um, the ASP.NET Core. So I'm going to change this to 8080 so it can hit the Node.js version. Okay, so let me go back into our Node.js Express Contact Service and we already have breakpoints. But one thing that we have to do is we have to always make sure that whenever we make changes onto the TypeScript file, we have to do a Control Shift B to make sure that they are all transpiled. And to see the output window, Control Shift U is the command that you want to do. So now we can see that it is only started transpiling now. Like I told you earlier, output and ID are dynamic properties, so we can ignore this TypeScript error. Okay, so now that it is transpiled, we can the breakpoints will hit correctly. So I'm going to put the breakpoint on both the get all as well as the get method. One will be invoked when you ask for a single contact, the other one will be invoked if you don't give a um, ID parameter or ID segment in the URL, it's going to return all the contacts. Okay, so now we have run the Node.js server by clicking on this, start debugging. And let's launch our Node.js server. Before we do that, let's go check the launch.json to figure out which framework did we ask uh, for, because we have a REST framework environment variable, which is set to express. That's exactly what we want. So we're good. 
Um, now let's go back into our client application. Um, let me open up that. I think there was some memory problem, so it closed. I'm going to open it up again. So this is going to be our project with the ASP.NET Core source code. Because if you see that um, in VS Code, the directory from where you launched VS Code naturally becomes the project for, for that instance. But there's also a special folder called .VS Code where you will put the launch.json which shows what tool to launch or what what type of project is this? And then there's also a tasks.json where you can specify what you need to do when you do the control shift B. Um, so for this project, we are running the .NET command. And for the launch, we run the .NET core launch. Whereas if you are inside of the Node.js folder, if you go into the launch.json, we are launching the um, Node.js with the starting um, program as Aurelia DA container TS. Similarly, on the tasks.json, we're just launching the type compiler to transpile it. So as you can see, um, currently the limitation of Visual Studio Code is that you can only have uh, one type of application in the launch, uh, but it can have two types of requests. One is called a launch request, another one is called an attach request. The first one is to, to launch the debugger from within the Visual Studio Code. The second one is to attach to an existing running application. But you cannot do uh, two configurations, to one to launch the .NET, um, another one to launch Node.js. That's the limitation right now. Some people use the task.json as hack, they assign multiple keystrokes like Control Shift B to run TypeScript, Control Shift C to run uh, .NET command line, Control Shift uh, um, another keystroke to run um, a gulp file or a npm file, um, so that they can simulate the 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 multiple launch setup, which is kind of like a nasty workaround. I don't want to do that. I would rather have two instances of VS Code. Uh, that's why we have this complete folder structure, a single folder structure, but with a neat hierarchy with the separate .vs code, one for the um, one for the Node.js application, another one for the uh, ASP.NET Core application. So that's how we are going to keep them separated, okay? So uh, let's give go. So it's going to launch our Node.js. Now the Node.js is waiting for us to make some requests. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the commander and then we will start running the, um, the npm start command, which is going to launch our client application which is going to bundle everything and, and start listening on localhost 9000. So let's hit npm start. And that's going to launch the um, the webpack dev server on port 9000. As you remember from the earlier parts of the tutorial, uh, the webpack dev server is very smart. When you make a small change into any, any client side code and when you save it, it's going to automatically hot refresh it. That's one of the cool things about the um, Webpack Dev server. As soon as it gives an OK, uh, we're going to start launching a browser and then start hitting localhost 9000. Let me go ahead and close some of the tabs. I don't want to leave them open. I will wait here. As soon as it is ready. Okay, the bundle is now valid and it's going to, it might show a couple of errors, just ignore them because they are for, from the unit test project. We don't really care about that at this point in time. In one of the future parts of the series, I will talk about how you can write unit test as well. Okay, so now that it is ready and listening on port 9000, I'm going to type localhost 9000. And you might want to hit F12 now so we can see the debug developer tools and hit enter. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to try to make a call into the Node.js. Um, let's see, there are some errors. Uh, can't resolve. Okay. Should be a simple problem. Uh, okay, uh, it's very simple. Uh, we have moved everything from uh, source into client slash source, which means that our main.ts file is still pointing to the old um, path, or our path that is going to be uh, two levels above instead of one level above. So we're going to go into that client application and then adjust it. So let's go into the client folder and then we will open a main.ts. Yes, it is no longer in in one level above. It is You have to go two levels above because the styles folder is two levels above. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change wherever I see dot dot slash styles, I'm going to change it to dot dot slash dot dot slash. 
so it'll go into the right folder and then load the CSS files and as soon as I save it it's going to hot refresh and the broken stuff is going to start working because now we've put the correct path into the style.css yep like I said it's going to first make the call onto the get all and we are we are hitting the express contact routes rightly so since there is no ID segment it's going to go into the other other else part and it's going to return all those four hard-coded contacts and you can see that they'll be displayed on the screen okay let me hit one of this um, it's going to be contact slash one because the ID one is assigned to the name Raja Mani so it's going to hit that other part which is the if part there we go because it is it, it is um, it's passing the ID parameter it's going to return that contact which is going to be uh, the contact named Raja Mani let's give go again okay and we have I have some client side breakpoints as well so just click go now if you want to delete something we can click on the remove contact and that is going to pass a delete method um, I think we're getting some unhandled rejection so let me see what's going on let us refresh it one more time it's going to hit the source code okay let me go into the express application uh, well let's put a breakpoint here as well we want to make sure that the course is enabled so let me click on the contact with the ID 2 ah, I know what's going on okay here's a small change that we need to make on the client side because if you go into the delete method it is expecting um, a ID property uh, in the body so what we are doing right now is we are passing a just the ID without the JSON object that says ID colon and then the ID of that contact which which is a slight change um, I made on the Node.js implementation but but we need to also update our ASP.NET Core um, as well otherwise it, you cannot use request.body.id because it is it's not going to be it's not going to read that structured JSON object so let us go and change our client application to pass a proper um, JSON object instead of just passing the ID value in the body okay so I need to go into the contact service of my client application under the services folder and as you can see right now I'm just passing the value of the ID rather than that I'm going to pass a proper JSON object so this is I'm going to copy the source code from the completed project and paste it over here and I'll explain that here we go I'm going to take this code out and replace that okay if, as you can see I'm creating a delete payload um, JSON object which has an ID property with the value of the ID that we pass and then I'm turning that into JSON and passing it and once it is uh, deleted it's going to return the contact that was being deleted uh, the reason why you're getting the uh, breakpoint is because as soon as you save the um, webpack will do a hot refresh that's why um, as you can see if you go to the browser it has already started the request which is fine so let's click go here there we go now that we made the adjustment on the client side to pass a proper JSON object we can hit the delete call comfortably and then it's going to come to the um, come here and then delete it okay let me click on the remove contact button there we go um, I put a breakpoint on the client side of the application as you can see and we're going to click go here it's going to now jump into the 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 default um, application use where we are setting the course headers and then the ne this next call will will send the call into our delete function there we go so now it is going to be deleted and as you can see I was just printing the value that was being deleted so that's why you're seeing that in the debug console of Visual Studio Code and here we got it back we'll give go here and then after after I delete anything I will get all again so it, it's going to hit the breakpoint one more time and every time you hit it it's going to first go to that um, catch all handler where we're enabling course for all the routes and then it'll come to the actual method there we go now that second contact is deleted uh, now that we've seen 
how to use the delete um, endpoint. We'll see how to use the post and put endpoint to create a new contact. Okay, I'm going to hit the new contact and it's going to hit the uh, the catch all handler. If you want, we can we can remove this breakpoint because now that we know the course is working, there is no reason as to why we should hit this breakpoint every time. And then it goes to the post, creates an empty contact and then returns that. So you will see that being returned and then and it will again call that to get that newly created contact and it gives an um, empty contact so I'm going to fill some value I'm going to put my friend's name and an email address with the phone number there is no validation I'll be adding validation in the later part of the series let's put some date and then click save so it's going to call the put endpoint now and that will store the contact into the in-memory array as you can see it's persisted it so now we can navigate again we can we can see that the get method call is working so we've played with the get with an id parameter without an id parameter post to create a new one put to modify the value and delete to delete them so we have seen all four http verbs working now let's change our asp.net core application also to take the delete payload um, JSON object instead of the simple integer ID. So I'm going to open up that um, ASP.NET-Core project. I'm going to go ahead and add a model named delete payload. And that's going to be a simple model class that's going to have only one integer ID property. So I'll copy the source code from the complete project and it's a very simple class delete payload with a single integer property called ID and then we're going to use that instead of the uh, integer property instead of the integer parameter in the delete call so I'm going to change this to delete payload and let's call it delete payload and we will use that property dot id to 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 the delete um, of the contact repository. Um, right now we are returning no content result, but if you if you look at the Node.js implementation, that was returning the contact that was deleted. So I'm going to do the same thing here as well. So I'm going to take the call from here to get the uh, contact, and then um, I'm going to return that using the OK function and this is also going to be delete payload dot ID and we're going to return the contact that was deleted okay so we have updated our server side um, ASP.NET Core REST API's delete method as well now let us change our client side um, um, configuration file to point to the ASP.NET Core implementation by changing this to 5000. Um, as soon as I save, it'll start hitting it. So I don't want to save it yet. I'm going to run my ASP.NET Core application and set the breakpoints. Let me go into the contacts controller. I'll put the breakpoints in uh, get all, get. And um, put and we'll put the breakpoint in all those methods. It launched the browser with the default port, which is 5000. And it said, hello world from ASP.NET Core 1.0 MVC control, but that's not what we are interested in. We can hit the, the API slash contacts method just to see if it returns all the contacts. And it came into the get all method and it returns the JSON object. Okay, so now everything looks good. So let's go back and 
save the config.ts folder okay and let us refresh it okay we're hitting the get method now and get all as well okay so the first contact is being loaded um, now let us you know click on the second contact and we can see that it comes to the get method and now we'll play with the um, new contact of uh, before that we'll do the delete contact and we'll see that the payload gets passed properly and we will be able to delete that yep so we can see that the id2 is being passed and i'm trying to get that first so we want to return this contact that was being deleted then we'll hit go and it's going to make another call to reload that okay now that the contact with the id2 is gone now let's create a new contact it's going to do the same thing it's going to return an empty contact and it's going to call the get method okay now I'm going to create a contact with my friend's name we'll put some valid date and then click save okay so we have played with the um, get all get a particular contact remove a contact added a contact so we have a single client application but that is able to make a call onto two um, server side rest api implementations one return using asp.net core another one return using um, node.js and by changing the parameter uh, or the or the variable base api url if you just change it to port 8080 it's going to call the node.js implementation if, it's, if you change it to 5000 it's going to launch the um, the asp.net core implementation uh, that concludes the final section of part six, um, happy coding.